this is so great. So um, what is the future of learning on massive viral platforms? My name is Melanie Whelan, and I am thrilled to be here to get to moderate a conversation with some of the biggest thought leaders in this category over the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, when we were preparing for this conversation, we really broke this down into three pieces of the ecosystem. There's the creator, the content, and then the platform. So we're going to guide us through a conversation using that as our framework this morning, and we're excited to have leaders here from each piece of the ecosystem to give us some insight around how to think about virility in education. So to, to kick us off, we'll start with content. You know, we have seen emerging trends around a real a barbell in the education experience, a ton of the market moving to user-generated content like TikTok and YouTube for the casual moment of need of learning versus and the other end of the barbell around intensive learning and skill and credential building. On the structured side of learning, historically, our education system has really defined the what of the content, the curriculum for K-12 and, and higher ed. So now, how do we think about the responsibility of determining the what of what our students will be learning? I'm going to kick us off with Jonathan to tell us how he, they're thinking about this at YouTube. Awesome. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonathan Katzman, Director for Learning at YouTube. So. At YouTube, first of all, it's we don't get to control this. You all get to control this. The creators out there get to control this. And you guys shape the content that is on YouTube. Um, what's been really amazing to me coming out of the ed tech world from a university I helped found Minerva was seeing the incredible rich content that creators were making on YouTube. And they were really doing it with the absolute best of education in mind. And the way that YouTube sorted the through all the education material, it was amazing to me how perfect the videos were that were bubbling to the top. And they were following all the principles of the science of learning and really focused on ensuring great education, as they say at this conference, from pre-K all the way to gray, and really figuring out how to serve lifelong learners. Uh, and that was amazing to see. And what I look out now at the creator economy, there's this real mix where people really gravitate towards filling in the entire K through 12 ecosystem, both here in America and abroad. And we see formal institutions like ASU and Harvard Med School taking part of the work that we're doing at YouTube and really contributing to that as well and really helping define what it means to have a continued lifelong education and having access to that on these platforms. And what is really exciting to me looking around the world is we see that not just in America, but I was just in Brazil a few weeks ago, and there we partnered with UNESCO, and they actually defined an entire curriculum for their uh, education through K through 12 equivalent, all defined based on creator work that had been done on YouTube with their effort being just to match the videos that were already present with their curriculum. So we see it as a real mix between the formal institutions, the governing bodies, and what really viewers demand uh, as they need to learn throughout their entire lives. Thank you. Parth, how, how are you thinking about this with what you're building? Yeah, hey guys, my name is Parth and I'm the CEO of PRAI. Um, brief overview, we're building a platform for mobile first short form education with AI powered coaching. Um, and building on Jonathan's point, like we also think creators are like the next generation of creators. They're defining the what, how to build it. And we wanna give them the tools to essentially make really mobile first education products. So if you look at the content companies that have been successful unicorns, companies like Noom or Duolingo or Calm or Headspace, what they've done is they've hired a bunch of engineers to make a really retentive, really gamified, mobile-first experience. The challenge is if you're an average creator or average educator, you don't have access to any of these tools. And so we wanted to democratize that, give those best-in-class tools to anyone who wants to create a really retentive, mobile-first learning experience, and also give them power to uh, do uh, AI-powered coaching experiences so they can scale their time. You can learn from the best um, at the scale of AI, essentially. Katie, I'm so curious for your perspective, having joined TikTok, what community-led trends are you seeing in content creation? Yeah, so I'm Katie. I am the head of education at TikTok. Um, TikTok's only been around for a few years, so if you think about it, we're just growing like weeds. I think we've learned really quickly that um, people want to learn, and that's huge. Learn on TikTok has over 317 billion views. Um, and so what we're doing is we're taking that and building out a whole STEM feed, 
where there'll be STEM content, and we're partnering with two different external partners to make sure that we are sending accurate information out in the ecosystem, and that should launch at the end of this month, so I'm really excited about that. And Lucy, can you tell us about the role of content in, in from your vantage point where you sit? Yeah, so I'm Lucy Cero, CEO of Articulate, and what we're, what we're really seeing is that proprietary content um, for the corporate environment um, is really the most valuable learning content. And uh, about 4 million courses were created on our platform last year. And you think about like a publisher like LinkedIn, I think they have like their catalog, their whole catalogs, like 17,000 courses. Um, so that proprietary content, the reason it's so relevant is that um, you know, imagine like a sales a sales leader. They want to to train their their sales team on you know objective ob objection handling. Is it is it more effective to have an objection handling course that really looks at your your products, your competitors, and how a salesperson can can um, overcome those objectives in our organization? And then you think about you know what if the best sales leader or the best salesperson on your team is actually creating that content. That user, that expert is creating the content um, for the other folks on their team and you're really shortening the distance then between the expert and the learner and that content is gonna be more relevant, it's gonna be more timely, it's gonna be more engaging, it's gonna feel more effective. That's great, thank you. Shifting us over to the creator side of the ecosystem, Jason, how are you seeing incentives evolve for the creators and what structural barriers to entry are there for creators to create content? And I'm, I'm curious, we'll turn it over to the platform heads as well to maybe you could, any asks you have for them in terms of how to better enable creators. Yeah, so Jason Wilmot, head of education at Canva. And one of the unique things about creators is that we're all creators or consumption. How many people in the room have created content or consumed it within the last 30 days on social media? Raise your hand if you have. Well, more than half for those of you on the, in the room. One of the things that we consistently see is that this content creation is done by, by many people. And you guys are the experts. And when we talk about the barriers to entry for teachers, they have the knowledge. They are the knowledge experts in the subject that they're teaching, but how do we get it across? And I, I think Jonathan mentioned what rises to the top and what's beautiful is typically rising to the top. And one of the barriers to entry for teachers is they don't have the expertise or the design capability or the platform to actually create a really engaging video. And I think that's the most important thing and some of the barriers that we have to solve as a platform is democratizing this from a platform perspective, allowing the everyday teacher who does have the knowledge and capability to teach, but make sure it's coming to the top on the platforms. Lucy, maybe you can talk a little bit about the role of the creator in the corporate training. Yeah, um, so just to echo what Jason and Parth are talking about, like we're really seeing that democratization of learning content creation. It used to be that learning was really kind of a walled garden. The L&D department was creating that learning and we're seeing that um, with the transformation of the workplace with the new world work, uh, digital transformation accelerating with COVID, that uh, creators are popping up all over uh, the enterprise and it's not just in the L&D department. You, when you think about it, there are learning um, needs in every single line of business and there are experts in every single line of business. So what you wanna do, um, to, to Jason's point, is you really wanna empower those experts to create these learning experiences that are really engaging um, that are easy to create, that, that look beautiful, um, and, um, and, and it's our job, as Jason was saying, to really empower that knowledge uh, to be unlocked from, from the experts in the organization. And Parth, that you, I think you articulated your building sort of the Shopify of knowledge products, and you, you've chosen short form mobile video as the format in which to do that. Tell us how you arrived at this as the delivery system and how you're working to enable those creators. Yeah, sure. So um, I think like at this conference, there's a lot of talk about AI and how ChatGPT was like the first company to reach 100 million users in record time. But it's important to think about the second and third companies were TikTok and Instagram. And so like short form video is not like a trend. This is the future. We're seeing all of this research on how attention spans are getting shorter. I was a product manager at Facebook for four years leading our AI and video efforts before I started teaching online. Um, and the secret I found to teaching online was short form video um, like my partner and I closed out making mid seven figures teaching online um, and the secret was just short form video and we started seeing that the 
the platforms that are built today for learning online are built for long form video that's meant to be consumed on a monitor or at least a laptop. The challenge is when you look at the data of where people are actually consuming and what um, platforms they're consuming on, it's mostly mobile. And the thing is, most people are ignoring that information products like books or courses, they have the same virality coefficient similar to tech products, where if somebody finishes it, they become net promoters, and they want to share that content with their friends. And so the platforms today aren't really, uh, at least for structured learning, they're not thinking about how do we maximize completion rate to unlock this vir virality factor in this market where customer acquisition cost really matters and you're trying to push it down. It's all about organic viral loops. And so our platform takes advantage of short-form content to enable more short-form uh, organic viral loops for structured course learning. Yeah. Jason, just going back to something that you shared around the educator at the center of what you do, and as you were, talked about this, authenticity being really important in terms of content delivery and what they're able to create, how do you think about ensuring at scale that the authentic message is enabled around the educator and, and what other tools are you giving them as the student becomes the master, the master becomes the creator and the creator is amplified? How are you thinking about that in your world? Yeah, I mean, I think, so at Canva, we have a creator community. We have a small group of teachers who are creating content basically for other teachers to use at no charge and we're consistently putting out subject-based content around math, social studies, history, art. And one of the key things is making sure that it's relevant and truthful and it's landing with the students. So we actually have groups of teachers that are the experts in the subject and then we have designers helping them build the design. And I think that's the important piece at Canva that we're focused on is not only making sure that these teachers are able to share their knowledge, but also that we're able to help and support them from a design capability. And to that end, to, to our platform leaders, what are their limiters that you're seeing in the ability for educators and educators as creators in terms of reaching more scale? Sure, happy to take that. So when I came to YouTube, there are really three parts to our overall strategy for learning on YouTube. One, for the viewer side, we needed to turn it into an active learning platform. And on the institutional side, we wanted to figure out how to work more closely with the institutions in this room. And then there was the creator side. And for creators, we needed to make sure that they were being paid equitably for the material that is on YouTube. And there's multiple parts to that. And it really goes the full gamut from the very short form video to the longer courses that we're talking about. Some of it, we're just writing on good YouTube business that's happening. So for example, we rolled out just recently our new shorts uh, revenue sharing model so that anyone who is producing a lot of great short form content as Parth was just talking about uh, is now gonna get paid directly from advertising revenue and subscription revenue on YouTube, which is amazing. Uh, second, they'll continue to see increased distribution on their regular videos and longer form videos. But then we also needed to introduce new ways for learners and educator creators to make money on YouTube. So number one, we introduced courses so you could actually get paid directly for your content on YouTube and actually do paid for online courses. And that's been just starting to roll out in the US and elsewhere. And then lastly, we also wanted to make sure that the content that was showing up in schools could be paid for, but not with ads because no one really wants to see ads when you're in like fifth grade math. And so we created a player for education uh, that is licensed by EdTechs, uh, folks in this room. Uh, and it's basically a subscription to all the content that is on YouTube and enables you to then embed that player in your technology and have it show up at schools and not show ads to students, not show links back to YouTube. And that way when a teacher does assign one of the crash course or some other video in class, they're gonna see that one video and not go and spend their time elsewhere. And so it was really a great way to see how the dynamic can work across multiple different avenues uh, for the full creator ecosystem. Yeah, I would say at TikTok, um, you know, we're really an entertainment platform. So people come there to be inspired, um, to find joy. So it's not really about, you know, a social platform where someone's visiting or someone's eating or what your best friend's doing. It's really what maybe your best friend's watching or learning. Um, and with that, it really is organic and being authentic. So I think it's a great place where teachers can show up and be their authentic selves. They they don't have to be an actor, they don't have to um, be funny, but they have to be real and relatable. And I think that makes it really easy for teachers to show up. And um, teachers, on TikTok, or teachers on Talk has 
billions and billions of views. So I say just come and be naturally yourself and meet the students where they are. Sounds like insights and usage and consumption is a huge part of the strategy that each of you are employing. I'm just curious, how much time do you all in your role spend observing what others on the stage are, are creating in terms of creator tools and enabling uh, mechanisms versus focused on what is unique and compelling and required on the platform in which you sit? I think, I mean, for me, I'm more in the data of like what is being consumed, like where are people, you know, gravitating to. And so with like the reason that we're launching the STEM feed is we see that people come to TikTok to learn. Um, and that wasn't necessarily like our thought of, you know, when TikTok started, it was maybe for some of you guys still think like dancing videos, but it's so much beyond that. So it's really seeing what people are naturally watching and making sure that we can meet with creators, to get more of that content out there. Yeah, I'll just build on what Katie's saying that we generally look at what people are doing on YouTube and really seeing how to support that and making sure they have all the tools and the ability for them to have their own insights into what to go create. I would just say for in the corporate learning space, the way that we look at it is we see what kinds of formats um, that our creators are using. Are they using more video? Are they building really long? courses? Are they building little micro learnings and then tweaking what we are offering as creator tools to those audiences to help make that sort of to follow the signal for what they want to create. And what we're seeing is that shorter, you know, micro learning uh, videos, those sorts of content types are resonating more and more. And we're seeing more content um, being delivered and built in, in those modalities. Um, Katie, I saw that TikTok ran a study with Susie that showed that when deciding on which schools to apply to, one in four TikTok users start by seeking information on the school's TikTok account. So how are you working with and advising higher ed to think about your platform? I think right now that's kind of like my main charter of uh, myself and my team is to really get with all the different universities, colleges, um, learning apps and platforms, and letting them know like there's 150 million Americans on TikTok, and it's a great place to connect with your future students and your students where they are. So that's first and foremost. And then explain to them how they show up and how easy it is to have students talk to students. Like they want to hear from somebody that's in the, you know, in that seat, a day in the life, um, what college campus looks like. That's like number one. Think about it. When we had to go to college, we had to go visit. We, our parents might have took a week off, took us to different colleges. Now they can go on TikTok and watch campus tours all day long. So it's really thinking about where the students are and helping um, all those education brands meet them there. And uh, in your journey, in your role, how receptive and partnerly have you found higher ed in terms of creating and meeting those students where they are? I thought it was such an interesting <laughs> way you framed it. Yeah, so um, I've been in digital marketing for about 17 years. I've had the honor to work at really awesome digital disrupting companies like a Zappos, um, like a Retail Me Not. Um, and I think of TikTok the same way. It's kind of came in and disrupted the way that we normally market. Like no more is do we want to see glamorous pictures. We actually want to see like the nitty gritty and like someone in their car getting ready for work. Um, so yeah, it's just really meeting people where they are. I'm sorry, I went on a little bit of a tangent, but what was <laughs> How receptive higher ed has oh, been in so, yes. these conversations sorry. and maybe just some successes that you've seen as inspiration. Yeah, so um, I do think it is one of those um, industries of verticals that are uh, it's new to me where I'm seeing that it's very legacy and very stagnant in the way that they reach students um, and they're not as receptive as they should be. And so I kind of just challenge everybody, if, if you're not on TikTok but your students are, how are you speaking to them? What, what are they speaking about about you if you're not listening? So um, it hasn't been as easy as other verticals that I've managed throughout um, my almost two decades, but it's really fun and I think you know, it's, it's the future and it's just gotten started. Uh, can I just add a little personal anecdote to that? Because I just got back from college tours with my 17 year old and um, the first thing she said leaving each 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 college was I need to go look at their TikTok and and they're True. looking at you know what are the other students saying about the college what is the college saying about so so real world <laughs> recent example of that maybe advice from Jonathan or Jason on other ways to think about partnering with higher ed and reaching the student where they are sure uh, so first if you are a higher ed institution please 
take your like very brochure wary mark like you know super marketing <laughs> versions of videos on YouTube and TikTok and you could leave them there but like they do to build on what others on the panel have been saying people students really do want to see the real deal uh, and that is the real deal in terms of student life that's the real deal in terms of courses you all have amazing content please work with your professors to get it up on these platforms that is what students want to see and they want you to be real and authentic. I think those words came up. And, and that really is what's amazing about these platforms is you are going up against other video content that is very real and very authentic and very much about the way people are truly living their lives and showing off what they're doing and what they're interested in. And <clears throat> that's what you need to do as a higher ed institution. Uh, now, the benefit is you get to come to the place where all the students throughout the entire land are coming to learn. And if you think you're going to meet them somewhere else, it's not going to happen. You have to meet them on YouTube, TikTok, these other platforms, because that's where the students are coming to bolster both their learning and their social lives and their understanding of what their futures can be like. And so the, your ability to take the amazing content that you have and put it out in a relatable way is really important. And just to piggy off that, I'd say it's it's easy to do. Like when I meet with universities or colleges, I'm like, create a student and body team. They want to do TikToks. So they will do it for free. And you know, I'm sure there's different legalities of whether you can do that, but they want to do that because creators is actually a whole new career that none of us wasn't something that when we were in college, but now it's a six figure job. So I think just tapping into the student body is a place to start and it's pretty cheap to do. Yeah, and one of the things I would say is that most campuses, you probably have 500 or more associate student clubs, whether it be TikTok, whether it be sports, whether it be badminton, you name it. One of the things that we are focused on here at Canvas supporting those clubs, I mean, we see esports, we see every different student club creating on Canva, whether it be a template, a short form video, and supporting, you know, and they're, they're posting it to TikTok, they're posting it to YouTube. Um, and that's one of the most innovative things that I would say I've seen over the last couple of years is just how prevalent on campus students are becoming at creating content. Um, and so that's where we're really focused on, meeting them where they are to help create that content, whether it be a short form video, a template, a news post, a magazine, and they can post it where they want. Yeah. Jonathan, you made a really interesting point around higher education and the value being not only in the mastery of content, but the signaling of a degree. In your role at a platform, and, and Katie and others, you know, do you think there is a role to play with the democratization of learning online for signaling or accreditation or other opportunities that your platforms can use to signal art? We know students are spending so much time consuming this content. We know they're becoming masters at either end of that barbell in some of the content that your communities are posting online. How are you thinking about the validation, potentially, of that for your learners? So this is something uh, we've put a lot of thought into, and we ourselves do not want to be in the middle of, of the accreditation and giving credit. We really want to find other industry partners that are out there that as they see that the learning is happening and as people are able to demonstrate their skills that they can go and get those credentials and put them on whatever platform they need to be. And we see that we know over time there's going to be lifelong learning and we know you're gonna to need to continue to show off your skills, and that's probably gonna happen more by doing and less by just having a signal or a credential. Uh, but like the last panel said, colleges aren't going away. I don't think they're going away either. They might change a little bit, uh, but certainly your ability to learn over time, like literally three months ago, prompt engineering, for example, was not a career, and now it is. And so your ability to show your abilities in those type of new environments is something you're gonna have to continue to do as a lifelong student. And when you go and get that learning on YouTube and elsewhere, you're gonna wanna be able to show that you did that because you can now accomplish a new task. Parth, maybe from you, the notion of signaling or credentialing, how you're thinking about that in the development of PEAR. Yeah, great question. So for us, like a lot of our creators are like industry leaders. So like our investors and creators include people like Steve Huffman, the CEO of Reddit, the CEOs of Cruise, the CEOs of Instacart. And what people like this are finding is they want to scale their time. Like they get reached out to like, hey, can you be my mentor? Can you be my coach? Can you help me create the next billion dollar company? But their time doesn't scale. Right. But like, what if you could create a world where it did like where you can essentially blur the lines between what is one to one coaching and what is video on demand where like 
creators and coaches, they get the same questions a million times, but right now we live in a world where you have to choose between, do I create a really high quality answer for a select number of the people who have questions, or do I give everyone a answer and make sure everyone gets a response, but it's not as high fidelity? And we're essentially creating solutions to help people scale. And so tying it back to signaling and uh, credentials, like I think we can def very much create like um, professional stamps for any creator, any institution, a business like um, companies or like uh, even conferences, right? Like if you do like a full track here, I think you'll leave with a lot of really interesting insights um, in whatever niche that you're interested in. So signaling and badging are things on our roadmap. That's great. Lucy, maybe we can shift to you now on, from a platform perspective, as we're shifting toward a skills economy and the corporate training is becoming a larger piece of the ecosystem, how do you see what you're developing interplaying with the higher ed experience and continuing that lifelong learner journey? Yeah, well, a lot of the new folks entering the marketplace, they are, the as um, employees, they are being um, taught uh, on TikTok, on uh, on Instagram, on YouTube, like this is a modern learning experience. This is what it should be like. They're coming into the workforce and they are expecting employers to offer them the same kind of learning experience, a consumer-like learning experience. They're also uh, expecting their companies to invest in them as humans and they're expecting um, to have that learning uh, feel like a real investment in them. And today, unfortunately, at a lot of companies, uh, learning is a chore to be endured. Uh, it's not something that feels like um, you're helping me. You're kind of forcing me to go through something that I have to. I have to just get through, uh, gritting my teeth. So, so I think that this new generation is really going to be forcing companies a to really show and prove that they are investing in them um, through learning, um, and then the companies are really going to be challenged to create learning that actually does feel like learning. So, in the skills economy, that that looks more like, hey, I am in the middle of this workflow, and um, I am I am getting a prompt that says, hey, I see you're struggling with this. Here's here's some uh, a little micro learning that that can can show you how to get better at this skill, whether it's a skill or a behavior. Um, that's where you really need learning, not just like information. Um, and so delivering up that learning in the flow of work that is really signaling to the learner, this is learning. This is not just information. This is not a chore is really going to help that employee feel like, oh, this company is um, cares enough uh, to, to, to invest in my development and, oh, I am learning this new thing. So it's really being digested as learning and in a way that's in line with how they've been schooled by these consumer apps. Yeah. That's a really unique position that you find yourself in to sort of carry on this hybrid learning solution that the platforms are building into the, the corporate workforce. And Katie, one of the things you said I thought was really interesting was this sort of democratization of you used to be able to need to see something locally to understand that's a career path for me. And now these platforms are showing a day in the life at a higher ed institution or a day in the life of a, a type of role that you could take, a career in front of you. So can do you think platforms have an ability to create almost internship-like experiences, a try before you buy for students as they're graduating or a, a career decision in terms of job switching of what that r new role could look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when you think about it, um, a lot of us went to college not really knowing what we wanted to do, and we get there and figure it out along the way, maybe change um, our degree. And I think having the opportunity to see all different types of jobs, whether it is, you know, working for Uber or DoorDash and like a day in the life of having this flexible schedule or being a teacher or being a doctor and, you know, how long it takes to, you know, get through school. Um, I think it gives you know, students, future students, um, an idea of what the life would be like if they chose that route. Anyone else want to offer internships or see it before you be it sort of opportunities that you're seeing in the market or lessons or wins that you've seen others create? No particular wins per se, but I do think this is like a sea change from when many of us in this room grew up to now is like your ability to go, ooch, to use the decisive term, into a job by watching any number of videos about people in that life and, and then literally reach out to them in comments and potentially directly message them. I mean, it's just, it's such an amazing ability that we have now. 
And I am sure many like offices of career services at colleges are probably not making that connection. Uh, so again, I think that is probably just another opportunity for folks in this room to, to work with how do you engage with people on these platforms, both as folks are coming into your institutions and as they're leaving to go find new jobs. Yeah. I would also just say like um, you're talking about about students learning, but I just want to sort of put a call out to the companies, you know, here that we have a lot to learn from the students. You know, they are the ones that are on the forefront of um, marketing, of, um, you know, we talked about authenticity. Um, there's a lot to learn that companies have to learn where they've been pretty stodgy in their, in their learning approach. Um, and looking at the new folks coming into the workforce and um, really asking them what is it that learning looks like to you and how can we how can we harness your ability um to to kind of evolve our, our organizations in that re regard it's a great point and it actually brings me to an, another point around accessibility and i think what's so exciting about the building all of your platforms is not everyone learns in the same way. And I've, we've all been through corporate training programs that are quite modular in their delivery, read and, and repeat. And now there's so many opportunities, whether languages or different learning styles, to enable more students and companies to learn more, more quickly in a way that is relevant to them. Um, so Jason, I'd love to know how you're thinking about sort of excel accessibility uh, within the Canva ecosystem. And this one's really near and dear to my heart. So I have a, a 10, well, he's 12 now, but during COVID he was 10 and my niece was 10 at the same time. My wife's a certified teacher. So we had two children learning at my house um, during COVID and I would, you know, come out of my office and I would see uh, my wife on our, on our window. She would have my shaving gel on the window. They'd be, they'd be touching it, drawing. Then they'd move to spaghetti and they'd write their names with spaghetti. It's more of a tactile learning style, you know, but she would kind of go through the gamut. Then she'd grab a computer and then there would be reading aloud. And so I don't think there's one specific learning style, but what I would say that we are focused on at Canva, and I think all ed tech platforms should be focused on is, you know, 25% of the world has a disability. If you are not taking into consideration that when you're building your product, you're failing your product. You're failing everyone around you. And I think that's the most important thing that we are doing here at Canva is we are focused on everything we do, thinking about it from an accessible point of view and how can somebody with a learning disability, how can we help them learn? How can we help them grow? And I think that's the most important thing I would say is really thinking through whether it's dyslexia, whether it's um, colorblind, whether it's whatever that disability is, because not only are you gonna help that individual, you're gonna help the other individuals. And I think going back to my example with my son and my niece is, he was sitting there playing with shaving cream on a window, but he was learning. And that was the most, that was really exciting to see that, you know, two completely different learning styles, but being taught the same way um, and both of them equally benefiting from it. So I would say that's the one most important thing is really taking into consideration, not because people have disability, but taking consideration for everyone. I think it'll be better. Parth, I'm wondering, as you roadmap your core product, are these sorts of learning differences and divergent pathways part of how you think about your content creation? Yeah, absolutely. So for us, like, we want to move from a like place where learning is one size fits all to a place where a learning is one size fits one. Like, how do we actually create these really personalized experience where we have the best teachers, the best coaches, the best mentors in the world, like the Barack Obamas, the Bill Gates of the world, but how do we help them scale their time where we can ingest their back catalog of content, make personalized models that represent them, that they're actually in the loop on creating. So it's the models aren't just hallucinating. Um, and how do we give you access to answer whatever question you have when you have it? We can quiz you and interact active ways and essentially like help you achieve mastery on a scalable but one-to-one -one way. Yeah, great. So Jonathan, you alluded to this in the beginning of our conversation, but you know, you travel extensively globally. Many of you are you know, traveling globally. There are markets that are ahead or moving in different directions than we are in terms of educational content delivery, community-led content delivery in education. Tell us what you've seen. Tell us how you study other markets. Tell us where you've been recently and your biggest inspiration coming back. Sure. So what's amazing when I started, when I joined YouTube and started talking to country managers around the world is many people looked at me and said, Jonathan, you don't understand. In our country, it's not that there's school and YouTube on the side for learning. It's just YouTube. And that was really shocking to me because you really have to take off your American blinders 
and realize that for many of these countries, the access to education, maybe not for the top few percent of the society, but literally for like 95, if not 99% of society, is really poor at their formal learning institutions. Uh, and that was a real shock to me to like fully come to terms with. Uh, but it was also an amazing opportunity by what we get to do at YouTube. Uh, and we have over 2 billion people use YouTube every day, and it really is an incredibly global scale. And so the ability for us to take both English content, for example, and auto-dub it into multiple languages so that content is available for students in all countries, seeing folks, I was just, like I said, came back from Brazil and was told there their top income strata to be in like literally their top 1%, you have to earn all of $2,000 a month. And that's you know, very different from here in America. And that was to be in the best schools, the best private schools, the best education. And basically below that, it was like a very steep downhill climb uh, to get good education. And so the ability for those learners, those students to have access to quality education on these broad platforms at scale and to eventually have AI tutors and things of that nature, I think is really a huge call to action for all of us to really change the world. And it's not just about what is happening and like my sons go to a very nice private school in San Francisco. They're having a great education. They still use YouTube and TikTok and others to boost their learning. But it's very different from when these platforms are literally your lifeline into an amazing learning opportunity. Yeah, and just to add there, I think you heard it this morning a little bit, just the infrastructure and the devices. I've been in ed tech for over 20 years, and 10, 15 years ago, I was meeting with ministries of education in India, Brazil, all over the world, and we were talking about a device, right? We're talking about how do we get them a device that the kids can use to personalize their learning with the internet? Well, 15 years later, we're still having that conversation, as you can hear from Jonathan. Um, and I think one of the cool things is obviously the phone and these applications that you're seeing can actually help that student who may not have access to uh, a nice computer and, and a solid internet, but they have a phone and they can see on TikTok and they can see on YouTube some of the learning capabilities. So I would say as we're building the applications, know that all over the world doesn't have the same infrastructure. They don't have the same internet. So maybe, you know, mobile short form and that video and thinking about that is gonna be really important for all of us. So in closing, I'd love each one of you to share you know, your perspective on what's the most important learning trend today. Uh, I think short form micro learning in the flow of work is probably for us um, where we think the learning is going in the corporate world. Um, and so we need to be leading on that. And how do you do that with harnessing AI um, to help with that, that creation um, process be as quick as possible, but also then have you know, the, the curators and the kind of overlooking that, that whole process. So um, short form AI empowered in the flow of work. We might have a, a lot of uh, unanimity on this panel on, on these <laughs> topics. Uh, I also am I'm a huge believer in the power of artificial intelligence of AI and what it's gonna bring to learning. Uh, it's just so amazing. I think we're all familiar with the Bloom uh, Two Sigma problem, and now we have a chance to actually solve that. I'll go a slightly different route. Mix it up a little bit. I think the most important thing is teaching kids how to learn to learn. No matter what's coming out, AI, it's moving really fast. Everything's going to move fast. So let's teach these kids now how to learn to learn, and then I think they can take advantage of all the tools moving forward. I think we'll be in a much better position. For me, I think it's just showing up. Um, I know everybody wants to know what's the latest trend. Um, it's kind of like winning the Powerball. Um, when there's 8,000 videos produced a minute on TikTok, the fact of going viral is, you know, very, very not, it's not going to happen, so to speak. So I think just showing up and being authentic and speaking to what your university, your college, your um, education brand stands for and you know and having it done in an authentic way by someone that's actually using the product or actually attending the school and for a lot of us and a lot of the younger generation they care about where they're going um, not just the college and what it stands for but like what the city is about what their experience is going to be like because that's four years of their life so I think showing up is should be the trend. Yeah, I think for me, I think something I'm really excited about is like we talk a lot about generative AI um, and 
there's like so much content coming out every single day, but there's never been a shortage of content. And now with generative AI, there's more than ever. I think what's really interesting is how can we personalize that content? So like, let's take the classroom example for like K through 12, right? Like, how do we get kids excited about learning math by having like Spider-Man or their favorite like cartoon character being the one teaching them? Like, how do we create really personalized, really immersive educational experiences that tie into the things that kids are already excited about? Or like lifelong learners, how do we get the big name leaders to be the ones teaching them and create that really curated, personalized experience because there's never been a shortage of content. People want more concise, insight-dense content in an entertaining way from a trusted source. And I think that's the trend we're going to see going forward. Thank you all for your contributions. I think I, I leave this conversation more inspired knowing that these five are at the helm of some of our most important platforms. And my advice is we need to teach our students how to judge the best use of their time, given how much content there is out there and how much data will be created. I know in my 11 and my 13 year old, whether it's noodles or shaving cream, uh, what is the best use of time and how do you create judgment and prioritization out of, out of all this incredible content driven by amazing creators on these exceptional platforms. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here this morning and enjoy the rest of your time.